welcome. We have some general business. Um, we have two member presentations, David Dunham and David Idavaya, uh, both of whom are remote. Yeah. Pardon? September, okay, never mind. The good stuff is there, we'll clean it up uh, at some point in time, you're correct. Uh, do we have any visitors tonight? Yes, in the back. Um, Steve's gonna give the microphone so we, the people on Zoom can hear your names as well. Uh, so please introduce yourself and let us know a little bit about why you my, stumbled my into here. Kerr. Paula, Michaela. And uh, are you from here in town or? Yep, it's one thing away. Oh, okay. So you're in Gilbert, great, welcome. Anybody else, any other visitors? Yes, down front, or a little more down front. Give us one time for the microphone. It's for the remote people. I'm Jim Armstrong. Uh, I brought my wife, Luann. She's a guest this evening. Okay. And are you from here in, in Gilbert or? Tempe. Tempe. Okay. Great. Well, we're glad you're here. Thank you. We appreciate your coming tonight. Uh, should be a fun evening. Uh, if you are not, and this is especially for some of the people that might be on the Zoom, because we keep getting questions about how do we get invited to the Zoom uh, sessions, uh, you need to be su uh, subscribed either to the EVAC announce or to AZ observing uh, the IO group. We send the mes message to both of those. At the very bottom of the uh, EVAC webpage, you'll see this section for subscribe. You click uh, sign up and what will happen is it will just ask you for your email address and there's a button that says subscribe. It's through free lists. We cannot subscribe you because of email rules. You have to consent that we will send you email. So you have to do it yourself, but that's how you do it. If you want to unsubscribe, simple, you click subscribe and then change it to unsubscribe and you can uh, disappear from the mailing list that way. Uh, but that is how we send out the Zoom uh, information. So be sure to do that. Uh, also, you will notice at the bottom of the page, used equipment for sale and equipment for rent. Uh, James Yoder um, has, I don't know what you're doing here down here. There, um, on that page, you will see we have some very, very nice used equipment. Uh, some of it gently used, some of it gently old, uh, but uh, it is something that's useful and at a very, very good price. So we would encourage you to get try that as well. The rent piece there. And the rent piece is there as well. Uh, we had fun with the All Arizona Star Party last weekend. We went out to North Hovada Road. Um, and except for the stupid people who were driving their ATVs on the uh, gravel road to be annoying, uh, it was lots of fun. Um, nope. And so we had some, some good views. Um, eight or nine, 19, something didn't hold. All right. So officers and board, uh, president, Claude Haynes, Vice President Woody Sims in the green. Um, Secretary is James Yoder, who's manning the webinar. Uh, Treasurer, Brooke Shields in the back. Uh, if you need to do any financial transactions or he'll take your money for shirts and things. Our board, Don Wrigley, Tom Austin, Steve Bradshaw, Alex Beck, David Kosho. Um, I uh, know that Tom is not here, Day uh, uh, Don is working the observatory tonight. Steve is over here. Um, and then James Yoder is the property director. We have a new name, Brandon Feldman is our webmaster. Marty Pasanka has retired from that position. Um, he's been transitioning with Brandon for probably about three to six months uh, doing this. Uh, Marty is also working the observatory tonight. I'd like to give him a round of applause, even in absentia for such dedicated work. Uh, we have a fun website. He and his granddaughter uh, developed the, the website, the refresh that we did a couple of years ago. He is still the newsletter editor. Um, and then we are still working on events coordinator, but we have a lead, so maybe that'll work itself out. 
But tonight we have officer election. Um, as president, there is a two year term limit and I have reached that. So Steve Bradshaw has volunteered to serve as president. Um, Nathan Eske, are you here tonight, Nathan? There we go. Nathan has uh, volunteered to be a board member and I've decided to become a board member, even as observatory manager, that board members are the people who actually vote on uh, the club business itself. And so uh, what we would ask for you to do, uh, are there any other nominations for officers at this time? If none, we would appreciate a motion to accept uh, Steve Bradshaw for president, adding board members Nathan Eske and Claude Haynes, and the other officer positions, secretary, vice president, et cetera, uh, retaining by electing them for another term. Do I hear a motion for that? Bob, okay. Do we have a second? Second, who is the second? So what was your name? I know James is going to want Richard Cannon. Thank you. There we go. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, for the Zoom folks, uh, any opposed, you can text message, but I think we're done. Uh, so thank you. We appreciate people volunteering and stepping up. Uh, it really is a sign of the success of the club for us to be able to continue our operations easily. Uh, the observatory is open for public viewing. Uh, yeah, it's a little cloudy tonight, but as long as Don can find the moon, we're in good shape because he's our lunar uh, expert. We are looking for volunteers. So if you are interested, it is a, um, there are two major uh, positions, I would say, at the observatory. T uh, telescope operator and a greeter, people who are at the door who, who use a clicker and count uh, as people come in, answer questions. Uh, so even if you're not comfortable maybe with telescope uh, operation or observing, uh, if you really just wanna help us to interact with the public and to explain uh, the operation, to point them toward the meteorite collection or where the restrooms are, uh, <clears throat> that's an important uh, function as well. And we could use some help. So if you're interested, just let me know. We do have something else that's uh, new for us. We have a project that we've worked on for a while, a solar walk. So this is an example of uh, the Mars plaque. There were several people, uh, Tom Austin, Tom Palakis, uh, Alex, uh, Steve, a, a bunch of people who really did help us with the text for the various uh, plaques. There will be two plaques hanging on the wall at the observatory, one to explain the solar walk and one, <clears throat> excuse me, have, I had a bad cold and my voice is just really dying tonight. Um, and another that would be the sun. Next to the observatory along the uh, walkway are the, some early rocket, rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth. On the other side, as you look at the uh, dots, the uh, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn have you going out through the park. So it is kind of an exercise uh, regime as well. Uh, down at the very bottom, the lower entrance, you're at the Kuiper Belt. So we have Pluto and the Kuiper Belt objects. So it gives you a chance to wander the park and, and explore, but it also gives you some fun facts about the planets uh, themselves. And so we are, uh, the uh, standards got put in this week uh, and Monday they're putting in the plaques. So uh, in the next few weeks, it ought to be finished up. Uh, <clears throat> now there's nothing better than all of the urban light pollution. And then these crazy people who decorate their house with so many lights. I live in, up the road in Gilbert. It's one of those like ABC TV where they won an award and now annually uh, this place just glows. So, so much for observing during Christmas, bah humbug, but that's the way it is. We do want to invite you though to our holiday party. Our next meeting is not going to happen. Uh, the holiday party is Thursday, December 21st. It's here in the library at 7 p.m. The town has a special event called Riparian After Dark. That's from December 8th through the 19th. It is a display of lights and Christmas music and uh, 
It's really lovely. It's kind of like Zoo Lights Light in that it's not as crazy as Zoo Lights. If you've ever been to Zoo Lights, it's actually enjoyable. You get to walk around and you don't run into everybody in town. Um, the observatory is open on Friday and Saturdays uh, during the event. Uh, it is a ticketed event, so you have to get a ticket from the town of Gilbert to get in, places fenced off, et cetera. So it's a little different. Because of that, we do not do the second Friday star party, and we don't do our third Friday meeting because that's during the riparian after dark. And it's really hard to get in and out of here. So we're going to have the holiday party December the 21st. Um, we will <clears throat> evac will provide salads and entree we're doing italian this year uh, water and tea dessert now feel free to bring, bring your own holiday beverages or cookies any treats that you want to share uh, with people as well but it should be a fun time for all of us and uh we'll see how that uh, you know we'll see you next month so tonight we have two presentations the first is david dunham so I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and David Dunham, if you can start sharing yours. Okay. Um, so this presentation describes our observations made near the southern limit of last month's annular eclipse in New Mexico. I won't have time to discuss the slides in much detail. Uh, they will be posted where you can access them later for more information. We tried to observe the 2012 annular eclipse from the northern edge of its path, but we made a mistake interpreting our handheld GPS instructions and ended up observing from about 15 miles outside of the path of annularity. So we wanted to make up for that failure by obtaining a good time recording of this year's eclipse. Um, we don't expect to be able to try to observe the next annual eclipse that will occur in the USA because that won't be until 2048. So we probably won't be around to do that. Um, so next slide. Oops, come on. Um, this shows the path across the USA. Uh, at the northern limit, the high mountains near the moon's south pole cause most of the Bailey's beads due to the reflection of the shadow through the inflection point above the Earth's surface. So most limit observers headed there. Uh, thus, we decided to record the less popular southern limit. Um, the Gallup, New Mexico area was the shortest drive for us. The GFS cloud forecast two days beforehand showed clear sky in yellow um, over the Gallup area between two areas of expected cloud, which shows dark. So we proceeded with our Gallup area plan. The forecast didn't change and we had great weather. Um, so we use Javier Zubier's, uh, Zubier's Google map shown here, taking into account the topography of both the Earth and the Sun, or Earth and the Moon, I mean, to select a site near New Mexico Highway 118. And uh, you click on his map and it gives you all the details uh, of the eclipse and circumstances. Um, including the corrections for the lunar limb. Um, this shows the GPS coordinates of our observing site. This, we were near a closed gift shop on the west side of Mentmore, New Mexico, about halfway between Gallup and the Arizona border. The afternoon before, the site resident gave us permission to observe there. This is a view looking to the west from our protected site, looking towards the gift shop. And this is just a view looking to the east. So we were in a very good location for observing the eclipse. You can see we weren't in the shadow. <laughs> there were some trees nearby. Um, our 127 millimeter go-to Schmidt Maxitov um, with recording laptop and a roller bag on a foldable table um, under a black towel. The signal from the camera on the telescope goes through the uh, black iota video time inserter. You might be able to see my mouse right there. 
um, um, on the ground before being fed uh, by another cable uh, to the uh, laptop. Um, this, uh, you can see the laptop screen uh, left of Joan's hand in this view, and the pair of binoculars with solar filters is also on the table. This is the view from our video recording. Um, it shows our run cam, astro camera with low settings, with gain set to two and brightness to to prevent overexposure and to focus well on spots. And uh, it also focused well on the bead. Um, we recorded occultations of these two sunspots about 20 minutes before annularity. We expected eight seconds, but we had 20, 21 seconds of annularity. This shows the many beads before and after annularity at one second intervals. Um, I'll show part of our video following showing of all the slides. And uh, this shows a website at the bottom here where you can uh, um, you know, get our presentation and the, uh, um, the slides on the videos. Um, anyway, we got a, a good recording, as you saw. And uh, this is uh, uh, John Irwin's uh, calculation um, of uh, what happened. Uh, he confirmed that we should have had 21 seconds of annularity, uh, just as we reported. After annularity, chickens on the property announced the second dawn as the sunlight increased. In 2019, we traveled to Argentina with the same telescope for a total eclipse. And we were successful there. This shows uh, Bailey's beads during that eclipse, some of them. And uh, these are color pictures of the eclipse uh, taken with another camera. In the 1980s, we and other in, uh, in IOTA observed solar eclipses from near the path edges to record Bailey's beads um, to measure the solar diameter. We analyzed these and past eclipse observations to try to see how the diameter might vary with time. By measuring many dozens of Bailey's beads phenomenon from our video recording, we thought we achieved results to a few hundredths of an arc second. However, when we got uh, two or more observers uh, video recording the same eclipse at both limits, so we had at least four or more stations, um, we could compare different pairs, and we found that the systematic errors with different equipment and whatnot, um, the sun doesn't have a sharp edge to really uh, uh, measure to. Um, it showed that the real errors were um, two-tenths of an arc second or more, or even larger, and, the, and much larger with older non-video observations. So it's not as good as we had thought, and probably no real variations that we could measure. Um, now, we just let others analyze the observations to try to improve their predictions for future eclipses. Um, so with that, I'll, um, I might have to stop and restart sharing. This will probably be the cleanest way to get to the video. So I think, you know, wait. Um, and I just want to mention uh, um, uh, for the 2017 total eclipse, Fred Grunges uh, got a spectacular recording from a location just uh, about a mile and a half uh, north of the southern limit in Missouri. And that's the link uh, to his video. Um, I'll, if we have time, I'll show a little bit of it. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to. I'll start just a little after the beginning. You can see the beads uh, forming at the top there. Um, 
Let's see, before annularity, the beads reappear um, from the. Wow. Uh, it's cool. And it gets even better. <laughs> Wow. And there we go, the last bead merged there, and now we have annularity for 21 seconds. And this particular video player has this bar and some of the stuff at the bottom there, the, the time insertion, the accurate time is imprinted on the video at the bottom. And there now annularity is ended with the uh, first, uh, um, cutting off of uh, of beads and beads start to to uh, disappear now. On the other side, you know, they were coming down from the top. Now they're um, the bottom edge of the horn is uh, starting to be eaten up. So since we have GPS time insertion, we don't need WWV recordings like you often heard with our earlier efforts. I don't know what I did there. Um, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're um, just about done. Um, what I think I'll do, I think I'll stop this one. I want to show a little bit of that total eclipse if we can. So. I'll stop the share again. David, uh, if you are not aware, David does a lot of asteroid occultations. He sends out monthly a uh, newsletter to the uh, AZ Observing uh, IO group. If you are interested in occultations, we can get you in touch with David. I'm sure he's always interested in finding some extra nodes to get some more data. He also has some equipment that he may be able to loan out. So if you're interested in, in asteroid occultation, which is really great citizen science, uh, and David and those the other people with him do a lot of great work with that, uh, let us know and we can get you in touch with them. David, we appreciate the presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to show you. I'd like to introduce our uh, featured speaker tonight, Professor David Idavaya. David's coming to us by Zoom uh, from his home in uh, Tucson, Arizona. David has a wide range of scientific interests, including ROVs, high altitude balloon experiments, radio astronomy, solar astronomy, and one of our favorite things, spectroscopy. David's also very active in uh, uh, outreach and uh, has built a portable uh, telescope trailer that he takes around for uh, public events, uh, lunar observing, solar observing. Um, so he's going to, the title of David's talk tonight is Small Do-It-Yourself Radio Telescopes for Detecting the 21 Centimeter Hydrogen Line Emitted by the Milky Way and Other Stuff. David says the talk will be an overview of several ways to use uh, do-it-yourself radio telescopes for various projects with emphasis on detecting the 21 centimeter line from the Milky Way. The talk will include information about the NASA Radio uh, Jove project, as well as Stanford University's Sudden Ionosphere Disturbance Project. He'll cover the radio spectrum from UHF to VLF. Uh, most of the rest of the time, David and I work in the visual range from 3,800 angstroms to 7,300 angstroms, but he's going to go long wave on us tonight. David, are you there? I am here. Okay, well, sorry for that introduction. 
Okay, so I guess I share my screen now. Yes. All righty. There we go. A little prologue to my presentation, how I ended up in Tucson. I was originally from Rhode Island. And it all started here at the uh, George Atkinson Station of Harvard College Observatory. Um, I was uh, teaching uh, high school physics and I uh, have a background in astronomy and uh, you know, a technical background in instrumentation. I worked at Raytheon, Anti-Submarine Warfare Division, and I wasn't too happy working in industry. And uh, so I decided I better get into astronomy before I got too old. So I walked into uh, David Latham's office at Harvard uh, College Observatory at Harvard, and uh, I had my five-year-old son with me, and we just walked into his office out of the blue. And I said, I want to volunteer some time. Uh, I want to get back into uh, into astronomy in a big time. And uh, I, I, I want to volunteer. I know that he was using the 61-inch at uh, Harvard College Observatory at Agassiz Station. And what they would do there is they would uh, set out the equipment and test it before it came out to Arizona to the multiple mirror telescope. So uh, here you can see a typical a New England telescope with the rust included. And this was the old uh, telescope that uh, was at Agassiz Station. It's closed down by now. Uh, here's a part of a detection system that uh, was sent out to Arizona. And here's me when I didn't weigh so much. <laughs> so I finally was hired to work at uh, the Multiple Mirror Telescope. I was uh, an instrument specialist on the Eschel spectrograph there. And uh, in 1983, this is uh, essentially the road up to the mountain. Uh, we didn't have uh, any gates or anything to keep the public up. We just left the road in really bad shape. Here's an image of the uh, multiple mirror telescope. It was one of the first multiple mirror uh, experiments to see if you could build a really large collecting area from a bunch of segments or actually these were six foot uh, diameter mirrors from uh, an Air Force uh, uh, secret uh, activity. And uh, one of the other things I was interested that it was that the mirrors usually look like this. You know, you would think you would have nice clean mirrors, but uh, maybe once a year these would get uh, spick and spanned, but uh, this is essentially what uh, the mirror looked like. So I was offered the job David Latham told me that, uh, yeah, be, uh, Tucson's a great place to raise kids. And uh, around Christmas time, we were out here watching Santa Claus prance around in uh, shorts, which was unusual coming from New England. So this was the control room in 1983. And uh, maybe some of you may have even used uh, terminals that look like this. Uh, bailing wire and uh, uh, nice gray duct tape kept this observatory running. This was the uh, Shell spectrograph. Um, and it's interesting because we're using Shell spectrographs for some of our work and Woody can tell you about it, that are about as big as uh, this little box here. But this is the uh, Shell spectrograph that goes on a big telescope. It weighed about 2000 pounds and we use forklift to uh, bring it up and hook it up. Here's uh, some of the innards. Uh, uh, servo motors that uh, position the uh, the grading. On Mount Bigelow, there is a 61 inch uh, Kuiper telescope and a Schmidt astrograph. And uh, this is the, the uh, view from uh, Mount Bigelow looking north, obviously. Uh, Mount Bigelow is, is just a little lower than Mount Lemmon, uh, just outside of Tucson. Here's an image of the astrograph, which is now used for near uh, Earth objects, and uh, this is the 61 inch, uh, 60 inch telescope, which uh, had at the time a uh, uh, a Monica that it was the largest hand slewed telescope. Here was a great big bar that um, this was my mouse that came off of this, and what you would do is uh, you would slew this with with your hands, uh, looking at digital readouts uh, to try to get it approximately where you wanted it to be. And uh, now we come to uh, fast forward. This is my observatory. We're going to talk about this little device here, and it's uh, some of its uh, uh, re re yep. 
it'll show up in, in different forms. Here's a uh, spectrograph uh, that's used and a telescope that I have in my observatory. So now the talk, small do-it-yourself radio telescopes for detecting the 21 centimeter hydrogen line emitted by the Milky Way and other stuff. And then you'll see what I mean by other stuff. The, the, uh, the design of the horn antenna is based on a poster paper. Uh, since this is being recorded, I'll let this slide stay up a few seconds longer. But you can get all the information you need if you wanted to duplicate this uh, uh, on your own. And alas, the Arecibo radio telescope is no more. It fell down, as you probably know, and it isn't going to be replaced which uh, is rather uh, sad since it actually did some good science, but that's another story. However, the jo uh, Kaljansky Very Large Array is doing fine. And uh, I visited that a couple of years ago, and that is a phenomenal uh, location and it's a phenomenal observatory. Uh, these dishes move around on uh, rail uh, lines up and down uh, the valley floor and it's uh, there actually enhancing the ability of this particular device. Uh-oh. So, uh-oh. Uh-uh. <laughs> well, that's cute. Ah. So, with that, the... Uh, the current uh, state of affairs in terms of uh, how things got going was, the, as you may know, the uh, Big Bang, and that's coming under scrutiny as well. And uh, if you look at this timeline, it moves out this way. And during this, these various sections along the way, um, you had a huge amount of energy, which uh, ultimately you had a decoupling of, uh, of uh, energy and, and uh, you had matter uh, actually forming. You had atoms, uh, the temperatures were going down so you could form uh, atomic structures. And ultimately, we end up where we are here, looking back at all of this wonderful stuff that has occurred. Now, the question is, how do you look at this stuff? So the beginning of radio astronomy uh, we're going to use the Milky Way as a radio source. Now, what's rather interesting is most of this stuff <laughs> started out as, as noise in someone's uh, equipment. We're going to talk about um, synchrotron radiation, which is a, a, a non-thermal emission. You know, you can create uh, things, uh, make things hot by rubbing them. You can uh, excite them uh, in an atomic way. But uh, synchrotron radiation is rather interesting. You have an electron that finds its way along a magnetic field line. And in the process, it gets rid of energy in the form of a radio emission. If you look at this little diagram here, this is where most of our work is done in the visual. Very small little cutout in the atmosphere. Uh, this is the region of radio, so from Earth we can still do a lot of valuable uh, work with uh, looking at these long wavelengths. Karl Jansky is sort of the, uh, the father of this observation. Uh, here's his antenna. It was on uh, wheels, and he can push it around in a circle. Uh, it was essentially an, let's see, probably it just looks straight up and worked around in a uh, in uh, in an azimuth so he couldn't really steer this thing so essentially it's a transient instrument which he could move the because of the way the beams could be formed in his receiver and and these little lumps here were the signals that he was getting here's part of his radio equipment and at 20 megahertz is one of the recordings he made uh, on a piece of toilet paper, <laughs> strip chart recorders. I actually got to use these as I was growing up in the field when they still had a strip chart recorders. Uh, this was an interesting fellow, Group Ruber, uh, built a 31-foot backyard radio telescope uh, around 1937. And uh, luckily, he didn't have to deal with HOAs because he probably would have never built this thing. But again, he was a ham radio operator and uh, using his radio skills, uh, he was interested in uh, taking a look at what was overhead emitting. 
and he did make the, one of the first uh, maps of the uh, the Milky Way emission, uh, and it was published in the Astrophysical Journal in 1944. His work was done at 160 megahertz, and here is his radio telescope uh, that's on display. John Daniel Krauss was uh, sort of the father of uh, of doing this in a very specific way. He was also a ham radio operator, and he designed and built with the help of students, and usually students get to build things like this. He built the Big Air Radio Telescope at Ohio State University, and uh, this carried out what was known as the uh, Ohio Sky Survey. Excuse me one second. This was known as the Big Air, and the Big Air no longer exists, but this is what it looked like. Now, in terms of where does this emission come from, nature does not like things changing. And anytime you have it, something changing in nature, nature reacts, and it tries to bring everything back to equilibrium in a sense. And in the process, whatever caused the change has to get re-emitted somehow. Well, the prediction of the 21 centimeter line comes from um, an electron that flips. Now, whatever causes the flip, we can deal with all sorts of different things, but for now, we'll just call it a first principle. And when the thing flips, in the process of flipping or accelerating or changing, it's going to emit a very specific frequency very with a specific wavelength and it happens to be at uh, 14 20 megahertz or 21 centimeters van der holtz uh, was a student and uh, he predicted the existence of the 21 centimeter it's called the hyperfine line of uh, neutral interstellar hydrogen in 1944. now what's interesting about this is uh, he did make the prediction and in 1950 Harold uh, Ewan and Edward Purcell at Harvard had heard about van der Holt's prediction at a conference in 1949. Well, Doc Hewitt, as he was called, was working 40 hours a week. He was designing instrumentation for the new cyclotron at Harvard. He was completing his doctorate in physics and building a receiver to detect the predicted 21 centimeter line of neutral hydrogen, supervised by Purcell, who was his advisor. Well, in the original paper by van der Holtz, van der Holtz said that predicting the existence of the line was not necessarily meaning it would be detectable. However, the line was detected by Ewing on Easter uh, weekend in 1951. And uh, here is uh, Ed Purcell. Uh, Daffy Bowen, I'm not familiar with his role in all of this, but here's Doc Ewing. And uh, this is a nice post fic a picture of uh, the three of them. This is the horn antenna that was used. Now, keep in mind, this is in New England and Harvard, and uh, it was a, uh, a transit uh, image uh, instrument. In other words, it looked in one particular direction. And in New England, it rains a lot. So here you have a funnel. Here's a little uh, cover that goes over it. But if you didn't have that cover down properly, uh, here's where the water would end up. This was the end of the uh, horn where the antenna was. This is the entire radio system that Ewan uh, had this, had built uh, to detect the uh, 21 centimeter line. And this is Doc Ewan at uh, NRAO uh, in Green Bank, uh, West Virginia with his, uh, this is the original horn. What was left of it is on display there. So let's fast forward from 1951 to the present and build a radio telescope to detect the 21 centimeter line. So you start off with a, a horn antenna. And again, think of, if you want to think of uh, optical stuff, this is the objective. And uh, this is similar to the one that Hewen uh, had built. Um, very inexpensively made with uh, this foam core insulating uh, material. Uh, and some wood to make a stand. But here's the interesting thing. Most people don't realize this. You know, you see all sorts of antennas, uh, uh, very elaborate looking. And uh, uh, way down here, that piece of wire is the detector. It's a, a quarter wave dipole, essentially. 
And all this stuff does is uh, what any objective would do is collect a lot of the photons, the radio emissions, and funnel it down to the detector, which is right here. All radio antennas essentially are dipoles, right? In different forms with different stuff that funnels all this energy to them, but that's it. So here we have a piece of wire that does the detection. And now this is the entire radio that detects. Now remember, Ewan's radio is a room full of equipment. So here we have, just for scale, this is USB connector down here. All right, this is a software-defined radio. Software-defined radio, SDR, is controlled by a computer. And what it allows you to do is to set the frequency you're interested in. And it has a huge range of frequencies available with an appropriate filter, which is this little black thing here, and a bandpass filter for uh, 1420 megahertz or 1.4 gigahertz. This is the... Uh, the front end of the uh, the antenna. Now, um, making this an analogy with uh, uh, visual stuff, um, the antenna coming in here, this is the objective of the telescope. Uh, this is your detector. So when set up in a transit form, the horn antenna is pointed straight up. Uh, the sun's somewhere over there. We're not we're gonna show you what happens when the sun's in the way. But uh, you can do radio astronomy day or night, clouds or not. And raining might be a problem because it'll get things wet down here. And the antenna, uh, it terminates here where the uh, SDR radio is in the filters uh, located right there. And then by coax cable uh, goes into the uh, computer. So what does the data from a uh, horn antenna radio telescope look like? All right. Here we have approximately 10 hours, which you're not gonna see all 10 hours, but uh, let's see if I can make this play. Yeah. I want you to look right here. And you see a little hump forming? Okay. Well, here is a, a, the, the floor of noise, you can call it. And here is a hump that's getting uh, built. The data's coming in, it's being accumulated. And uh, this is 10 hours worth of uh, stuff going on. Here we have uh, noise. This is from my uh, security cameras the, that transmit uh, wirelessly. But look at the hump growing. And I'm going to in increase the speed here, but pay attention to that hump. As time goes by, it grows. You get a second one starting here. And what you're looking at, and you notice it's shifted off frequency a little bit. That's real. And what you're looking at, and it's going back the other way now, what you're looking at is the uh, the following. Here is the uh, the beginning of the scan. Uh, Milky Way is off to the side. The antenna is pointing straight up. It might have uh, maybe a 40 degree field of view. Uh, you can you compare that to your optical stuff and it's a very big field of view. And uh, of course, by using a bigger antenna or many of them, you can you can narrow that field of view. And that's what they do with the, the large radio telescope. So you, you, they build these uh, uh, false color images of what the radio source looks like. But so this now is the Milky Way as it's progressing it during the night. The antenna is looking right up into this portion of the Milky Way. And that's that little hump there. And then, oops. And then uh, later on, just before sunrise, here comes the sun here. Um, the Milky Way, we're now looking at a different portion, and that's that uh, portion uh, that you see. So now you can use uh, other types of antennas. What I did here is I used a, uh, this is a 2.1 or 2.4 gigahertz uh, Wi-Fi antenna. It has a really high gain compared to the uh, um, the horn antenna. And because of that high gain, the loss by using it at a different frequency, it really didn't affect the, uh, the outcome of what I was doing so much. Right here in, uh, is the radio and uh, the SDR and the uh, filter, and it's connected up to computer. So what does this data look like? Here we have, again, a 24-hour drift scan. 
and you can see that hump. And you can see a very interesting uh, occurrence here. This is actually a Doppler shift that you're seeing from the uh, Milky Way as it, it moves overhead. And, you know, piece of it's coming toward us, piece of it's going away. And you're seeing the Doppler shift. Now, this is reversed from what you would use in uh, optical astronomy. Blue would be down this end in optical stuff and red up at, at this end. Uh, this is exactly the opposite. You have uh, red down here and blue up here. So the red shift is here and a blue shift is this way. Uh, you can also do some fun stuff with the image and clean up the noise. Um, this also looks like a, a P. Signy, but it isn't. But uh, it's interesting in nature graphs only come in certain they only look certain ways and what's important is what's on the uh, x and y axis in terms of what the graphs tell you but everyone understands this this is noise and by using uh, a, a routine you're able to get rid of uh, the noise now this is uh, another uh, 24 hour uh, scan but what i did on purpose is i aimed the antenna uh, where the sun was going to be at a particular predicted point in time to show the effects of what happens to the ionosphere when the sun's in the way. So here we have uh, that uh, Doppler shift going on. And right here, where everything sort of flattens out, is when the sun was in the beam of the, uh, the horn. This was done, obviously, during the day. And you can see it even better here. There's my there we go it just flattens out and this is the noise from the uh, wi-fi uh, camera all right another way to uh, to do this is with a project they are also now using uh short, short wave uh, sdrs as well but um jupiter is a radio source at 20 megahertz and uh you could actually pick this up with a short wave uh, uh radio with the uh a uh, gain uh, turned off, the automatic gain turned off. But uh, here we go. So the discoverers of Jupiter's radio emission, uh, Franklin and Burke, uh, discovered that uh, this is what's uh, going on. Uh, they were observing the Crab Nebula with uh, uh, a radio telescope. And again, uh, here's the radio telescope that was used. It's a bunch of dipoles. All right, very um, well, long wires, longer than the, the gigahertz uh, uh, frequencies. But uh, here we have, um, with, again, here's the Crab Nebula pulse that they were looking at, and his noise. Well, this noise turned out to be Jupiter, right? So this discovery was uh, was announced in, uh, in 1955 at a AAS meeting in Princeton, New Jersey. So the radio uh, Jove telescope, again, this has been replaced with an SDR radio, but this uh, hasn't. This is the antenna. So what's interesting about uh, using this type of uh, uh, arrangement, uh, you can actually steer the, uh, the beam that this thing is going to receive uh, to some degree. And you can do that by causing the phase to change slightly by using different lengths of coax. So Jupiter is going to always be somewhere in the sky, but uh, the antenna is always going to be looking at the horizon, essentially. And uh, by changing the phase, you can actually raise that um, uh, signal or the signal gathering uh, uh, properties of the antenna. But you still start off with uh, a dipole. And <clears throat> this is, <coughs> excuse me a uh, typical field. Now, again, using these simple techniques, you could actually at your observatory set up a radio telescope uh, if you're interested in uh, uh, showing the public how, uh, how really long wavelength is received. And again, uh, non-thermal emission. Now, the Jovian uh, decameter sources essentially come from um, Io and uh, uh, Jupiter, there's a Taurus that's built around. Dude, there's a huge amount of, you know, that Io is volcanic. So it spews out a huge amount of uh, uh, sulfur and, and such. And uh, it's a dynamo, essentially. Um, there's a 10 hour rotation period of Jupiter. And by looking 
uh, the probabilities of picking up some emission in uh, three definite areas that have been identified. The um, this is what you get. Now, what you're going to hear the actual radio emissions. You can pick this up uh, and actually hear this while this is uh, having happening. But pr the probability is that it doesn't always happen. But here we go. Here's Io. Okay, so those are the actual sounds that you can receive uh, from Jupiter. Now, the sun also uh, has outbursts that can be detected at uh, 20 megahertz. And uh, this is a, uh, a, pl a plot of uh, what a particular outburst might look like. Um, this is a solar burst that has a shock fin uh, form. Um, sunspot groups emit uh, solar uh, radiation in the form of uh, radio waves that uh, can be picked up. And uh, another way of detecting uh, solar flares at very low frequencies is the Project SID, uh, and they now call it Super SID. Uh, it's now going over to a, a shortwave defined radio, but uh, the receiver for this is very simple. And here's what happens um, during a 24-hour period to the ionosphere. Uh, here you have nighttime. Um, some of you might be familiar with, uh, if you're a ham radio operator, uh, uh, skip, where you have a very long uh, distance transmissions, uh, or AM radio listening to an AM station at night. They they have to reduce the frequency or they change the, the direction that the energy is being radiated and you stop picking up really far away stations. Uh, here's a transition from uh, nighttime to day, and uh, everything's quieted down now. Uh, around local noon, you get a peak, but the uh, ionosphere is quiet. And then uh, here we go again at nighttime. Now, looking at that, when a, slow, a solar flare occurs, it disturbs the uh, um, ionosphere. And here you have a uh, uh, a cartoon showing three, four uh, various types of solar flares. And what happens is the shop rises in, uh, in uh, the radio transmission. Now you say, well, what is the radio transmission you're looking at? This system is based on looking at very low frequency radio transmissions from uh, essentially uh, the Navy uh, and some other government facilities have these transmitters around the world um, uh, several of them are used to communicate with submarines. Um, some people would think that you couldn't talk to a submarine with radio, and you can with very, very low uh, uh, frequency and very high-powered transmitters. And there are several of them around the world in various countries that they use. And uh, this is what you see. You monitor these stations, and you can see these fluctuations. All right, so here we have uh, nighttime, daytime and here's a, 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 a burst that uh, was detected, okay? Now, of course, being an astronomer, you can't, can't uh, div divorce this from, uh, from astronomy, right? So in uh, 2017, um, I uh, took my family. We had the great Papa's Great American Eclipse Expedition. We ended up in Douglas, Wyoming and uh, had all sorts of stuff set up. And one of the things I brought up was the uh, the SID antenna. This is about six feet uh, across. And uh, this resembles, uh, some of you probably remember old AM radios, those big uh, radios with a, maybe it had a, a record player inside it. But they had the old uh, radio, tube radio, and in the back, 
there was a, a wire antenna that sort of made a great big loop. And uh, so that is similar to this. And of course, here's some very high free. And here's a better view of that. And here's my assistant, who's now 15 years old. But uh, she was helping me collect data with the, the Super Sid antenna. So what does that data look like? Well, here's what it looks like. Nighttime, okay? Sunrise. There was a flare that occurred. And guess what it is? That's totality. This is during the total eclipse and what happens to the atmosphere, this is the ionosphere, when the sun is blocked off. So rather interesting. Of course, all sorts of weird things happen during a, a total eclipse of the sun. And this is just a look at the, uh, uh, the ambient light level during the eclipse. So, in summary, there are three types of amateur radio uh, telescopes that you can deal with. You can actually build the, um, the horn antenna for very high frequencies. Uh, you can uh, build the Radio Jove uh, high frequency, uh, sponsored by NASA and uh, got its place, uh, Space Flight Center. Or you can build and get involved with the uh, Stanford uh, Center Super activity at very low frequencies, uh, 10 to 40 kilohertz. Uh, any of these would be fun to have at your observatory uh, to show what happens at other wavelengths. And uh, the stuff with Jupiter, it's it's pretty hit and miss. Um, sometimes you'll get flares, you'll, you'll get these bursts of emission. Sometimes you won't. Uh, we don't understand it completely. Other people that get involved with this stuff, it's still a lot of things we don't understand. But but uh, you can you can collect this data, and I think it's interesting for people to see. And with that, uh, I'm done. So thank you for your attention, and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, questions, questions for uh, Professor uh, Idavaya? Um, which SDR did you use? Uh, the cheapest one I could find. And they all work. <laughs> uh, what you want to do is is find um, uh, the biggest problems usually are with um, the filters and the preamplifier or the amplifier stage. And again, uh, there are a couple of uh, manufacturers that use those. I don't recall exactly the one that I had, but uh, the original SDRs were actually um, uh, digital TV tuners uh, for these uh, tiny little TVs, and uh, they moved. Oh, that's a familiar face. Hi, David. So Hi, how much do they cost? Thirty dollars up to forty or fifty. Cool. That that horn antenna. I, I I understand the concept of the dipole down in the at the bottom. What's the horn doing? And are there peculiar dimensional requirements like grinding by objective lens? Yeah, the the horn is essentially the objective. And the dimensions of the horn, you'd want some multiple of, of the wavelength. So in other words, you want constructive interference by the time this, the signal that's uh, detected uh, uh, is, uh, well, collected by the horn is in phase. So it gets to the antenna without, uh, without uh, being out of phase. So it'd be like any, any, any uh, system where you're dealing with waves. Oh, yeah. And there's, and there's a magic to the angle of the cone. Yeah. Is it's in that paper that's described, but it, it's not that um, for what for what this does, it's not that uh, important. I mean, you could be a little sloppy. I mean, I <laughs> I cut it with an exacto knife, and I exactly well, I measured. Okay, this is probably close enough, and uh, it worked just fine. So, cool. Thank you. Yep. What bandpass filter do you use? before the SDR? I don't recall the uh, uh, the manufacturer of it, but um, you'd want one that has a, a, the narrowest band pass that you can find. And of course that raises the, the cost. Any other questions? David, have you ever hooked up the uh, uh, radio telescope to a speaker 
And if so, what did the Milky Way, Jupiter, and the Sun sound like? Okay, the uh, you heard what Jupiter sounds like. The, again, um, if you use the um, a radio, an AM radio specifically, uh, amplitude modulation, the radio itself is going to take the signal and convert it to uh, an audio uh, frequency. So Jupiter sounds like um, noise, and, and it clicks a series of clicks or whoosh, whoosh similar to that. Uh, the sun again would sound like noise, but the uh, the burst, the outburst, uh, the outcome of that burst over a period of time would be less than you're able to hear. So unless you were able to translate the uh, um, the uh, the signal into something that's audio, you wouldn't hear that. Uh, Super Sid again, the, the frequency is so low, uh, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't hear anything. But to just hook up a speaker, uh, you wouldn't. The speaker would just depending on uh, what was how much power you had going into the speaker you might hear some crackles in the uh, 20 megahertz range but uh, it, it's you're not going to hear anything just hooking up a speaker you'd need an amplifier and and uh, detection circuit uh, to uh, to decode whatever is coming in it's not like a crystal radio <laughs> okay uh one more Hi. So just to, to clarify from what you said before, would you need uh, a um, amplitude modulation like a, a, an AM radio or would you uh, shift the frequency down to, to the audio range? Which which of those would either of them work or, would, or which one? OK, if you let's say you had a, show, a standard uh, ham radio operator um, transceiver or maybe just the receiver. And uh, what you would do is you turn off the automatic gain and uh, it, you'd use it in AM mode and you'd set it to 20 megahertz uh, hooked up to an appropriate dipole antenna. And uh, if you pick up any uh, signal from Jupiter, it's going to be demodulated through the circuitry of the radio and turn out uh, as a, a series of, uh, of uh, uh, whooshes and clicks and uh, and uh, such sounds. And that that's how you would detect um, Jupiter's uh, output. You didn't have to do anything. The radio is doing all the work. OK, I think that's it. Thank you, David. We really appreciate it. This has been a really fascinating uh, presentation and really kind of a fun idea of looking at um, the universe in spectrums that we're not used to seeing visually. Uh, so thank you. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your, your uh, invitation. So I think basically we're done. A holiday party, remember, December 21st, 7 p.m. Uh, we will add that you uh, RSVP, so we get a good count as the amount of food and things that we need. Uh, thank you. We will see you.